So, oil and water testing. It's something that's becoming more and more uh, important in environmental testing. And, and why is this? Well, fat oil and grease cause major problems in our sewage systems and they uh, discharge and they cause blockages. Uh, anyone that's done some, some plumbing at home when they take their kitchen sink apart will see this type of thing. Well, imagine this on an industrial scale and the problems that it can cause. So what we're seeing in the Water Industry Act was that you uh, under, under an obligation not to discharge anything that could interfere with the operation of the sewers or the drainage system. And we've also seen more recently with the costs of these increasing and increasing that the authorities are chasing the polluters and the offenders. And so it's become more and more important to keep tabs on what's going down your drains and if it's causing problems with your uh, drainage system. So where does the fat oil and grease come from? Well, a lot of cases it's food production. We've seen lots of interest in food production over the last 18 months. Uh, if you're making ready meals or working with dairy products, uh, there's a lot of naturally occurring oils within those. Uh, a lot of industries use uh, fat oils and grease as a raw material. So for uh, leather industry, for cosmetics manufacture, this is the basic material they're working with. And clearly some of it does go down the drains. And we're also seeing interest from uh, the companies who are disposing of industrial waste. They need to know what fat oil and grease is in there so that they can characterize that before they dispose of it. Before we sort of look in the um, uh, the InfraCal, which is what we're talking about this afternoon, we're just going to do a review of other analytical methods that you can use for determining fat oil and grease. So starting with gravimetric, most techniques start with this uh, solvent extraction phase, that you have an aqueous sample, you shake it up with some organic solvent, it makes two phases, uh, and all of the fat is there in the solvent phase. So with gravimetric, we then separate off that organic phase, we evaporate away um, the organic phase, and then what's left we're saying is fat oil and grease, and we calculate the content by mass. So it's quite a nice simple technique. Um, and okay, it uses an okay amount of solvent, not too much, but it's quite laborious, it's quite time consuming. Um, we need to get an accurate result, we need to get all of that organic phase, which means we've got to do that separation very well and very, very accurately. We also have what I call the perils of achieving constant mass, that you've got something going in and out of the oven onto a balance. A lot of variation in that process makes it very, very hard to get a good, good, accurate result. And it's very time consuming and it's not really a very accurate method for achieving uh, a good result. So moving on, something a bit more accurate, a bit more scientific, uh, GC or with MS or with FID. Again, we do the same first phase. We'll filter the sample, so an extra thing to do because GCs don't like having lumps put down them. Um, we inject it onto our GC and then we just simply have to interpret the data. So it's a lot, again, it's, it's not a quick and easy technique. It's relatively time consuming um, and it's got high cost capital equipment. But you also need to have a laboratory to do this. So you need to have um, people to work in the laboratory. You need whole infrastructure. You need gases uh, and lots of safety things. So it, it's a big, big cost built around doing the test <clears throat> by GCMS. And then, of course, you have to have the expertise to interpret the chromatography because we're looking for a sum of all the fat, oil and grease. And GC is going to give us all the individual components. So we've got to try and interpret that into a meaningful result. And we're also going to lose something um, GC, you're either going to lose the, the bowly polar um, items at the start or you're going to hang on to the very heavies at the back end. It's very difficult to get a technique that's going to give you everything that we're looking for. UV always gets thrown into these comparisons. We expect miracles of UV sometimes, I think. But again, the first two phases, we filter the sample, we stick it in the UV, we press a button and it gives us a number. Um, it's a nice, simple, easy to use uh, technique. It's quick, the equipment's not massively expensive, it's portable, but we're not going to see everything we're looking at. We're only going to see things that have a chromophore, so typically that's only aromatic species. But what we're able to achieve from this review of all the different analytical techniques is that we're able to have a wish list of all the things we want our equipment to do. We need to be nice and quick, easy to use, um, not too expensive uh, to purchase, it's handy if it's portable 
uh, and we need to be able to see everything that we want to quantify. That's probably the most important one and maybe should have been at the top there. So introducing to you the InfraCal um, for doing fat, soil and grease with infrared. Uh, it's, a, it's a mature product. It's been very successful all around the world for doing oil in wastewater. And the second generation, as we see here. So we're going to address these questions. We're also going to address at the end how we can maybe extend its performance and find additional things that it can do. So what does it do? It just does one thing. It looks for fat, oil and grease. OK, and then we can apply that to these uh, application areas here. So oil and water, TPHs, fat, soils and grease. So but it's basically it's just doing one thing and has one function. So like those other techniques, we're doing a solvent extraction. So we have the choice here of either using a solvent that's lighter than water in terms of hexane, or we can use a chlorinated solvent, which is heavier. Um, and we can choose that depending on quite how we want to prepare our sample. My personal preference is to work with hexane because it's there on the top and it's nice and easy to sample from. Uh, it's got a very, very quick um, sample preparation time around about five minutes, which I'll show you shortly in a short video clip. OK, so you see on the bench here the InfraCal, along with everything else that you need to be able to, to run the sample. So we have the wash bottle of hexane, which we need to just give the, the top of the instrument uh, a couple of drops just to clean it between every sample. So our 100 mils of our sample goes into the large uh, measuring cylinder. It's quite important that you use a glass stoppered a measuring cylinder because the Teflon stoppered ones can give some contamination which give you a false result. Uh, a smaller measuring cylinder for measuring the 10 mils of hexane which gets poured into the top and we can also do some other sample preparation in bottles. So if you're out in the field uh, you don't have to carry all the glassware. Uh, the gl bottles we have are graduated so it's quite easy to do some sample prep. So 10 mils of hexane goes into the measuring cylinder uh, and then we give it a short a short shake up. So typically uh, between 20 and 30 seconds uh, of shaking. If you're doing lots and lots of samples, there are automated laboratory shakers that can can do this for you. Uh, and you see there after shaking, you've got your water and your hexane in two discrete layers and all of the fat, oil and grease in the sample is now sitting in the hexane layer. So we take a sample 60 microliters from the top hexane layer and then we present that to the instrument. OK, and there we see that's all the sample preparation. <coughs> and the sample's ready to run. OK, so the next video is continuing on from that. So the hexane will evaporate away and then after about three minutes, the sample will be measured. Uh, this video has been cut away a bit, so we're not all standing away around three minutes. Uh, and then the result is presented on the screen at the end. And we can change the degree of accuracy that we have. We can change the units to report in whatever units we want to have it in. But that, in a nutshell, is how easy the InfraCal is to operate. OK, the InfraCals come uh, pre-calibrated from the factory. So you can take it straight out of the box, put it on the bench and work straight away. You can do your own calibrations, of course, as well. Uh, it's very flexible and it's got the capabilities to doing that. And we can also provide you with glassware field sampling kits uh, if you don't have those things already available in your laboratory. <coughs> so what we've seen in the UK, we've seen a large increase in the number of food processors or food, food producers who are looking at this, uh, wanting to have control on typically what's processed and what's discharged after their water treatment works. We also see a lot on sort of the North Sea business on oil rigs, uh, but also and more increasingly in environmental, that people want to take a quick snapshot look at a sample and see how contaminated it is. Uh, we can also do this on soils as well as on wastewater. So in a sort of five, 10 minutes, you've got a good idea of what the nature of your sample is. So why have people bought in for Cal? <clears throat> well, what used to be acceptable um, was to take a grab sample every week, every two weeks, every month, uh, submit that to an external laboratory, um, get the result back and then see if it was within your consent limit. Well, there was a degree of tolerance to being out of consent as long as it didn't happen too often, um, but we're seeing that tolerance go away really. 
and companies have induced fines um, for being out of specification. Of course, they don't know when this happened. They don't know why this happened. All they know was the sample that they had two weeks ago was out of specification. And there's no opportunity to control the process. So that's the, one of the big reasons we've seen of people buying into the technology. It's also very easy to use. Um, you know, you've, you've seen the operation of it. It doesn't need a great degree of scientific knowledge or of training to operate one. And you don't need a laboratory. Um, back in the summer, when we still had COVID restrictions and we were out there seeing customers, I was doing a demonstration in the customer's car park because uh, it's going to be battery, battery operated. So we just had a trestle table set up outside in the sunshine. Okay, there's two units um, that are available. Um, the ATR is the, working, the one you've seen working with hexane. The Trans SP runs with uh, tetrachloroethylene. So the Trans SP is preferred in environments that are a bit sort of dustier or dirtier or um, where you get a little bit of motion. It's not easy to get the instrument on a flat surface maybe. Um, <clears throat> whereas the ATR is, is kind of adopted more in food and environmental where there's at least a piece of bench space that it can be operated on. So it's been established for a long, long time, uh, over 40 years. It's been proven to be rugged and reliable at doing this specific application. And it's quite a, a relatively low cost piece of equipment. The purchase price is between sort of nine and 12,000 pounds, which is a lot less than, than GCMS or some of the other techniques we've discussed. And when we go back to those other analytical techniques, and we had our wish list of things that it needed to do, we said it needs to be quick. Well, even if you're the slowest of slowest laboratory chemists, it's going to be around 10 minutes for doing a sample. It's got to be easy to use. Well, we've seen how easy it is to operate. Having it pre-calibrated in the factory makes it even easier to work with. It's not excessively expensive. It can be used in a laboratory, in a field, in a car park, uh, pretty much anywhere that you've got a bit of bench space to operate it and it quantifies everything that we're wanting to be able to see in our samples. Now, I've made a point that it does do one thing and it has one uh, capability, but there are some ways of getting more from, from the InfraCal. So they come shipped from the factory with a 0 to 200 ppm calibration range, but we can we often see that especially with consent levels, they're around 400, maybe 500 ppm. So yeah, that's not fitting fitting perfectly, but we can exchange the extraction ratio to alter the calibration range of the instrument. And then, let me show you some examples. <clears throat> By doing a one to 10 extraction, we have a range of 200 ppm. And that's really a concentration step. It's not a dilution step. We're going from 100 mils of water into 10 mils of hexane. But if we're going from 100 mils of water into 20 mils of hexane, so that's a one to five ratio, we can go up to 400 ppm and so on and so forth, up to 2000 ppm is typically the highest that we've been. And we can see this on the calibration curves. So this is a typical calibration curve for 200 ppm, and you can see it's the same shape curve for 400 ppm, because all we've changed is the dilution ratios. And again, at the bottom left corner, uh, we have up to 1000, the bottom right, we have up to 2000. And there they are all on one chart. And of course, the nice thing with the InfraCal is that all of these calibrations can exist on the same unit at the same time. And all we need to do as a user is select which one we're going to use before we run our sample. So it makes it a very, very flexible instrument with a wide, wide operating range. A problem we see often with samples that contain surfactants is rather than get two nice discrete layers, we can get this emulsion forming. So you can see here, it's very, very hard to see where the hexane water separation is. Um, and with more surfactant, that makes that emulsion more and more stable and it will never ever um, separate out. So a, a number of different things that we can do this. The simplest one that I like is adding a teaspoon of table salt. And you can see immediately you start to break that uh, emulsion. Uh, you could also use something like sodium sulfate would also do it very well as well. Um, but this sample after about five minutes of, of, of resting would then have two nice discrete layers. Something again we're asked for more and more and more is can you see saponified and non-saponified materials? Well, the first answer is no, because the infracal can see fat oil and grease. It can't distinguish between these two things. 
But by changing the extraction chemistry and changing the chemistry of the sample, we can differentiate between them. So, <clears throat> saponified material is one that uh, a fat has been reacted at a higher pH and becomes water soluble. So non-saponified material remains and prefers to be in the hexane layer. So only the non-saponified material is quantified by the InfraCal. So we can do this calculation by running two separate samples. So the raw sample, if we sampled it, will, and we do the extraction, will tell us the total non-saponified material is in there. If we add a couple of drops of acid and we lower the pH, okay, then all that material becomes non-saponified and it all comes into the hexane layer. And so sample B is then total saponified material becomes sample B minus sample A. So a bit of maths, a bit of acidification allows us to see the difference between the two types of sample. Okay, and that brings us to the end. So um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I think there was a question about the cost. Um, the typical cost is between about nine and twelve thousand uh, pounds. The variance in there is uh, how many calibrations you want to have, and uh, whether you need carrying cases and glassware and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Could you also replay the video? I'm not too sure. I don't know whether it's frozen. Or oh, the video. The video not play very well. Let me let me scroll back up to the video. So even in, in COVID times, we are able to come and do demonstrations uh, for the InfraCal. Okay, let's see if we can get that to play. There we go, is it this one? Okay, can, can, uh, can whoever asked the question be able to see that? Can they pop a, a comment in the, the Q&A box? Yep, I think, I think we're good there. So I'll just talk through this again. Um, while, it, while the video is playing. So it shows all the glassware that's needed. So the 100 mils of sample goes in the, the large measuring cylinder. Uh, and to that, we're going to add 10 mils of hexane. And that's that one to 10 extraction ratio um, that I mentioned. Uh, and then that gets a, a good shake up. Um, not everyone's samples tend to look as nice and clean as these. Um, most sites I go to, uh, people's samples are yellow or brown or they have lumps floating in them. Uh, it really doesn't matter because we're just taking the extract layer so we can deal with as, as dirty and as difficult samples as you like. Um, we could deal with soils, we can deal with, with semi-solids, we can deal with sludges, you know, pretty much any sample you like as long as we can extract in hexane and get two discrete layers. Uh, we're able to work with pretty much anything. So uh, sample shaken up and then we're going to take 60 microliters of that sample and deposit that onto the top of the instrument and because the instrument lays flat that forms a nice a nice steady film uh, and the hexane layer evaporates away. Okay this video this whole video is on YouTube uh, if anyone likes to just goofy just Google InfraCal YouTube, you'll come up with this clip as your as your first hit. OK, were there any other questions? OK, As I say we'll, we'll happily come and do demonstrations. We'll happily for you to send us samples and um, we can do stuff over the magic of the Internet. Uh, you all have my contact details anyway, so if there's a question you'd like to ask offline, then, you know, please do so and get in touch. And we are uh, lo looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you.